I'm Joe Stringer. I'm a principal architect at Isovalent, a Cilium co-maintainer, and a member of the eBPF Foundation's eBPF Steering Committee. It's my pleasure to round out the day with this keynote around building the kernel of tomorrow with eBPF. Firstly, I'm inspired by this community and how it's grown. I'm inspired by how individuals like you are driving the future of how operating systems solve real world problems. The reason we're drawn towards eBPF is because eBPF allows us to build the best possible solutions to the problems that we face. Through this talk, I hope to inspire you about how we can leverage the power of eBPF to build application-specific kernels. Over the course of this talk, let's take a look at how the kernel is moving away from larger opinionated APIs towards reusable concepts and primitives. I want to take a look at how we can navigate the line between stability and flexibility as we tailor the kernel to our application-specific use case. And finally, I want to apply this to the real world by talking about how Cilium builds a cloud-native OS layer. Innovation is at the heart of the eBPF community. So how do we ensure that eBPF continues to be an engine for innovation? First, let's recap the difficulties with the traditional kernel development process. Historically, it's been hard to change and extend the kernel to, to specific use cases. Additionally, it was difficult to deploy and experiment with new functionality and observe those solutions in real environments. There was a bit of a tension in the API trade-offs as well for tailing the kernel to specific tasks that we face versus its role as a general purpose operating system. One early approach that was commonly used in Linux was to build opinionated models around solving particular problem spaces. Just in networking, we can look at several different subsystems that all provide abilities to route and filter and mangle packets. This has been a source of ongoing debate as use cases grow and overlap and converge between these subsystems. eBPF redefines where the API boundary is by providing tools to tailor the kernel. Broadly, this is, consists of lower level primitives with well-defined constraints. And with eBPF, we can express the same higher level models by injecting programs and maps into the kernel at runtime. But at the same time, we're not locked into those models over time. Updating them is easier because it's all distributed with a user space application. So eBPF provides a strong base model to then innovate on top of. Innovation can't occur in a vacuum. Innovation requires that strong platform for people to build on top of. What we're seeing now is efforts to stabilize the fundamentals of the eBPF model. People are looking for an eBPF-like experience on other platforms, whether they be non-Linux OSs or hardware devices. Earlier this year, the IETF established a working group with prominent members of the eBPF community, which will focus on standardizing a lot of the core eBPF model. But this raises the question, will we standardize all of eBPF under the IETF? The challenge here is that there's a spectrum between the stability of a system and the flexibility of that system. While the stability provides a strong basis for innovation, if we commit to stable APIs too early, that can potentially limit what we can do in future. The way that we can solve this is by building up strong primitives that are supported by multiple different use cases. There are various ongoing efforts to extend libraries, compilers, and languages to support more flexible representations of eBPF programs. And we're also consolidating some of the core eBPF APIs in the kernel around concepts like BPF links. BPF links allow convenient management of the lifecycle and detachment of programs and allow multiple programs to be attached directly through kernel APIs. But with all of this, there's also needs for general mechanisms that will automatically adapt to the kernel as it evolves. This is an active area of development that we'll continue to talk about. So the question is, how do we protect the flexibility of eBPF over time? Let's look at how the kernel can adapt to the use cases of the future, even the ones that we don't yet know about. As new use cases arise, we want to tailor the kernel to those patterns. Even the smartest person in the room can't predict the future. While the barriers to kernel contribution have previously been high, which encourages committing to API models earlier than we'd like, eBPF in general provides tools for us to be able to better deploy and iterate on those models. But there's always more to do. 
The biggest example of some of the recent changes is the rise of k-funks and k-pointers in the last couple of years. This makes it easier than ever to expose kernel functionality to eBPF. While mo uh, with modern eBPF built on these newer primitives, there's a much tighter binding between the user application and the kernel code, even if that kernel code is defined in eBPF. The eBPF maintainers have been putting a lot of thought into how to retain the flexibility in that approach. But the result is that we have a future where we can tailor kernels to become application specific. So let's took its look at some models for this. So as I talked about, the application is more tightly bound to the behavior of the kernel with these newer models. There are various different concepts that have arisen in recent times in which the kernel ideally would adapt to. If we look at a, this sort of question, where in the kernel is the current Kubernetes pod? Where is the Docker container? Where is the virtual network? While these concepts that have recently arisen may be backed by kernel functionality, there is no first party notion of these concepts in kernel APIs. An interesting possibility here is that we can potentially inject these new concepts into the kernel at runtime with eBPF. This way we can learn more about how those concepts fit the underlying architecture in real world environments, and we can choose when we want to commit to those stable APIs. With this model, there's a range of different use cases, but it's particularly well suited to modifying kernel control logic, such as routing or enforcement of a policy. This does raise the question though, how do users combine multiple eBPF kernel extensions on the same host? There are multiple layers, as I mentioned, with BPF links, but there's also user space solutions to this problem. Let's take a look at some of the user space models for this. There are various different daemons out there, such as Leaf and BPFD, that allow you to load and run your eBPF programs, and potentially their user space companions, to modify the kernel fun functionality. This has the potential to simplify and streamline eBPF deployments into an environment. Some of the desirable properties with this model is that it can determine canonical ordering between eBPF programs when you're loading multiple of them. At the same time, it expects stronger API boundaries between those eBPF programs to provide correct behavior. This often pairs with looser coordination with the companion programs. I look forward to seeing how the APIs of these applications are developed to balance the spectrum of stability and flexibility for future innovation. Another goal that these daemons may address is how to guarantee the authenticity of eBPF programs. The idea here is how would we cryptographically verify that the right code is running, even in an environment with malicious actors? There's a trade-off here depending on the sorts of models that are used to deploy eBPF programs. If the eBPF programs themselves are relatively static, then one proposed model is to sign those eBPF programs out of box in some secure environment, and then validate their authenticity when loading into the kernel. There are also applications like BPF trace that dynamically generate code at runtime. A proposal to try to handle this case is by signing the applications themselves and then leveraging read-only file systems with authentication primitives to prove that only these programs can modify the kernel, even if you have root access. This topic is under active discussion and may have real repercussions on future flexibility of eBPF, so I'd encourage you to participate in them. But let's move on to how Cilium leverages the concept of tailoring the kernel to specific applications in cloud-native environments. Cilium aims to provide a modern cloud-native networking layer that, provides, that solves problems around networking, security, and observability. Since the beginning of Cilium, we've had the strong desire to challenge the status quo. And a common refrain is, if we could start completely fresh today, while knowing what the demands are of cloud environments, how would we design a networking system to solve those problems? How can we tailor the kernel to our special purpose application? Let's talk about that application. This won't be a comprehensive list, but it should give you a good sample of how eBPF can help us to solve problems of today in new ways. Some of the new changes with uh, cloud native environments is increasing scale. We're talking about tens of thousands of applications interconnected across clusters. This drives the need for performance and efficiency. With that scale comes churn as the applications come and go. 
network policy must follow those apps as they migrate throughout the cloud. And furthermore, it's important to be able to operate these clusters. This is both in terms of how we mitigate problems as they arise and how we debug problems when they do occur. So when building an application-specific kernel for this use case, we were able to discover some unexpected solutions by looking at problem spaces holistically. Let's consider a web application that's trying to reach out to a peer over the network. For every connection that that connection is, uh, application establishes, there are many messages that it may send, and each of those messages may be broken up into many packets. So if you perform load balancing operations for every single packet transmit, the CPU time starts to add up. Some approaches to solving load balancing have been to move the load balancing into the applications themselves using client libraries. But with that model, every single app needs to be individually updated to depend on that library. Historically, it's been difficult to modify the socket or TCP layers, so the natural place to solve this load balancing problem historically has been at the packet layer. Through eBPF, we were able to modify the kernel functionality at the socket layer, allowing us to reduce the number of load balancing operations to once per connection instead of once per packet. This allows us to achieve orders of magnitude faster load balancing operations. So we can find a sweet spot for how to solve problems like this with eBPF. Another use, interesting use case is how we propagate the knowledge of pod identity. Kubernetes has this notion about how each deployment has a corresponding name, namespace, and labels. And traditionally, solutions that would implement uh, policy for these uh, use cases are not able to propagate all of that information down into the kernel. The identity is lost when crossing the user space kernel boundary. So the representation at the kernel and network layer is different from the representation at the higher layers of the stack. This can make it more difficult to handle the high churn of a cloud environment and more difficult to debug when something goes wrong. With eBPF, we can inject that identity knowledge directly into the kernel at runtime with custom eBPF logic. And led down the road, if we want to extend the notion of that identity, we have the freedom to dynamically update that too. What's neat about this approach is that we can propagate the same identity of the application all the way from the control plane down to individual nodes to attach to the application, into the kernel via eBPF, and even into the packets. This is enabled by things like in Kubernetes, we have strong flexibility through custom resource definitions and enabled by eBPF in the kernel. In this model, Cilium manages the identity associations for these applications at runtime. And this cuts down the effort required to be able to correlate the identity of that application to the traffic that's generated by it, as this identity is present at every layer of the stack. Let's take a look at how this impacts cluster operations as we observe what's happening in the network. With the identity bound so tightly to the application, we can build observability tools that help us to more easily reason about how traffic is flowing through the cluster. The same data path that's implementing control logic to route those traffic and apply enforcement can also emit events with cloud native metadata built directly into them. From an observability perspective, we can also tailor how much information is emitted rather than being forced to either emit data for every system event that occurs or only aggregate. This allows us to shine a light on the areas that we need more information from without overlo overloading operations tooling. While I'd love to spend more time digging into the details of how eBPF allows us to tailor the kernel for these cloud native use cases, I don't have forever. So let me just leave you with this. So we've been working on a range of really interesting use cases in the Cilium community for the last several years, from sock maps to gracefully terminating remote connections on other nodes to file integrity monitor. These are mostly listed in order of older to newer. So if you're interested in any particular item here, there are often blogs or presentations out there that you can find about these topics. Several of these are also under active development. So reach out if they're relevant to your use case. If you're curious to learn more, Isovalent hosts a range of labs to explore some of the capabilities of Cilium and Tetragon. And hang around with us in Slack after the summit and in the coming days. There's so many ideas we've heard throughout the day and would love to continue the discussions. Of course, there's ebpf.io with a range of resources on there for getting started with ebpf as well. So with that, 
I will thank you for spending time with us today. I hope you're inspired about how you can use eBPF to build the kernel of tomorrow.